On Thursday, April 17, 2019, at 4.35 p.m., inside the USC General Justice Building at Joint Base Grissom, I finished my coffee and checked my watch. The day had dragged on, and I was eager for it to end. After three hours of testifying and answering questions, I found myself in a cramped room with just a TV and my thoughts for company. I'd been waiting for over two hours since then, wondering when the board would reach a decision. The door swung open, and Commander Tom Baker, my legal rep, stepped in. The council's done for the day, Lieutenant Jones, he informed me. That's me, William Jones, or Bill, to friends and family. I'm a senior flight lieutenant in the United States Space Corps, formerly the Space Force, established nearly 80 years ago. They want you back at 8 o'clock tomorrow, so head back to your quarters, Commander Baker instructed. And remember, avoid chatting with other witnesses, especially your wife. You mean my soon-to-be ex-wife, the cheating one? I clarified. He nodded. Exactly, he affirmed. Now, Lieutenant, get going and steer clear of trouble. Aye, sir, I replied, rising. I stretched, grabbed my case, and left. I drove my compact electric car back to the BOQ, where I changed clothes, microwaved a faux meat burger, and grabbed a beer. After a quick meal, I settled into my chair, turned on the TV for news, but found nothing interesting. So I reclined, reflecting on recent weeks. Until recently, I served as the weapons officer on the USS Armstrong, a top spacecraft named after a moon-landing astronaut. It seated 110 crew and boasted formidable firepower, nuclear missiles, energy weapons, rail guns, and mini lasers. The Armstrong's maiden voyage to Jupiter was special because my wife, Tabitha, was also on board as the chief pilot. We were high school sweethearts who pledged exclusivity and shared dreams of space exploration. Despite being stationed at the same base, our missions often separated us. While she was away, I delved into GravTac, a martial art suited for low-gravity environments, honing my skills in strength and tactical prowess. I never once doubted Tabby's loyalty. My trust in her was unwavering, never even entertaining the idea of her being unfaithful. Despite occasional temptations, I remained dedicated to our relationship, never envisioning any betrayal. We often fantasized about experiencing closeness in zero gravity on the moon or Mars. When we both received orders for the Armstrong, it felt like our dreams were coming true. However, what began as a dream turned into an agonizing nightmare. I vividly recall the day of my departure. Friday, January 3, 2019, at Canaveral Launch Complex, Florida. Clad in my suit and lost in thought, I boarded the passenger shuttle headed for the Armstrong's orbital dock, accompanied by 20 others. Tabby, serving as the chief pilot, had departed hours earlier on the first shuttle. I followed on the third, with three more shuttles set to follow. Seated beside me was Commander Jason Travers, known as Bull for his size and demeanor. I remembered him from our academy days. He had been Tabby's counselor and a strict instructor. Despite knowing him, our interactions were minimal, limited to a few classes. Excited to serve with your wife, Jones? asked Bull. Yes, sir, I am, I replied. This will make history, he remarked. Heading farther than ever, I informed him. Jupiter and back in under 100 days. Quite the mission. As the pumps hummed beneath us, signaling our imminent departure from Earth, Bull ensured everyone was ready. Time to bid Earth goodbye. That's it, let it go, he grumbled before reclining. With visors down, we braced for liftoff. The rockets rumble and the pull of gravity intensified. Through the window, clouds rushed past as we ascended, the sky darkening to reveal the planet's curvature below. The shuttle shuddered as boosters detached, destined for reuse near our launch site. After an hour, I spotted a distant structure. There she is, Bull announced, lifting his visor. Docking soon. Thirty minutes later, the shuttle approached the open dock, matching its speed. Two tubular structures extended, connecting with a hiss as pressure stabilized. There we go, Bull said. Prepare for some gravity. Ships at 0.8 g. Knowing the Armstrong's gravity system could be adjusted, I anticipated relief from weightlessness effects like fluid shifts and muscle atrophy. As the crew signaled, a green light flashed over the hatches. Bull stood, signaling others to follow. I unfastened, grabbed my bag, adjusting to the ship's reduced gravity from the shuttle's near-zero gravity. Within steps, I felt the weight of my gear. Four hours to station launch, folks, Bull announced upon our ship entry. Let's hustle. Three more shuttles are right behind us. Knowing our cabin's location, I headed there, hopeful to find Tabby. Though she wasn't present, her belongings filled half the closet, indicating she'd arrived. After stowing my gear and shedding the spacesuit for my flight suit, I grabbed my uniform cap and headed to the bridge, ready to man the weapons console. 
The bridge buzzed with activity as I ran calibration routines and checked weapon inventories. Ensuring cruise missile platforms and weapon stations were secure, I prepared a report for Captain Alan Simmons, whom I recognized from our time on the Shepherd. Upon the medic's departure, I submitted my inventory, acknowledging our past service together. He signed the inventory, and we verified our key codes. Only three people held keys to the cruise missiles, the captain, the first officer, and me. Two keys were required to launch. Good to have you with us, Jones, Captain Simmons said. I hear you're married to our chief pilot. Tabby smiled at this. Yes, sir, I replied. Great, Alan said. Should make the trip more interesting for you. Yes, sir, I hope so, I said, glancing at Tabby, who smiled mischievously before returning to her tasks. Bull arrived on the bridge, inspecting everything. His icy stare signaled it was time for me to return to my post. Better get back to my station, sir. Alan nodded and moved on. I returned to my station, confirming all calibration tasks were complete. Everything was in perfect order. Knowing Captain Simmons' penchant for impromptu weapons drills from our time on the Shepherd, I ensured weapons were always ready and the targeting system was calibrated. Each shift started with a calibration check to maintain system accuracy unless a malfunction occurred. Finally, Alan began the pre-launch check while we strapped in. Operative, he called. All systems ready for launch, replied Lieutenant Sam. Engineering, Alan continued. All systems normal, proceed to launch, said Chief Engineer Lieutenant Sam. Weapons? All systems calibrated and weapons accounted for, I confirmed. Comms? Communications 5x5, five five, sir, said Lieutenant Denise Simpson. Navigation? Course plotted and locked. ETA at Mars Station is 440 hours, reported Lieutenant Ryan Halcombe. Number one? All personnel in place and ready for launch, Bull reported. Allen nodded and pressed a console button. Houston, this is Armstrong, requesting permission to launch. Launch authorization granted, Armstrong. Godspeed, came the response. Roger that, Houston, Allen replied, then instructed. Spatic, this is Armstrong. Retract all lines. Copy that, Armstrong. Lines retracting, came the reply followed by sharp sounds as the lines retracted. Moments later, we received confirmation that all lines were retracted. Start the engines, Alan ordered. Engines running, Brian confirmed. Take us out, helmsman. Nice and easy. Don't scratch the paint, Alan said with a smile. Aye, sir, Tabby responded, pulling two levers and holding the control column. The ship moved forward slowly, nearing the spaceport exit. We relied on maneuvering thrusters, as firing the ion fusion plasma thrusters inside the dock would damage both it and the Armstrong. Soon, we were clear of the structure. The space dock is ready, Tabby said. We'll spiral out of Earth orbit to a point between Earth and the moon, then fire the big engines. That's the cue spot, she explained. I could see the tracking on the navigator's console. An hour later, the navigator announced, ETA to cue point is two microns, sir, the road is clear. This meant no debris or rocks were detected ahead. Copy that, Alan said. Engineering? Engines warmed up and ready, sir, Brian confirmed. Alan informed Houston. Armstrong approaching point Q. Approaching Q point. Copy that, Armstrong, came the response. We watched the countdown timers, preparing for the launch. At zero o'clock, Alan said, Pump up the tires and light a fire, helmsman. Let's see what this girl can do. Tabby's hands moved over the console. Kicking tires, starting fires. Aye, sir, she replied sliding the control levers forward. As the engines roared to life, the force of acceleration gripped us, the hum intensifying with each surge of G-force. We soared at speed surpassing any human's experience. Casting a glance at Tabby, I beamed with pride, offering a smile, a wink, and a thumbs up. Returning the smile, she glanced at Bull. Sensing Bull's tension, I redirected my focus to my console. An hour later, a foreboding feeling crept in. Bull's posting of the officer's schedule on the bridge didn't surprise me, but seeing myself assigned to the second shift did. In space, time follows Houston's schedule, with dimming lights simulating nighttime during the second shift. While it's not a formal rule, typically, senior officers take the first shift. Seeing Bull place me on the second shift felt like a demotion, indicating limited time for Tabby and me to be together since she'd be on the first shift. If fortunate, we might catch a glimpse of each other during shift changes. To say I was pissed off was an understatement, and Bull knew it. Is there a scheduling problem, Lieutenant? He asked. I looked up to see him in front of my console. Alice had also walked over, having seen the schedule and curious about his explanation. Am I still the senior weapons officer, sir? I asked. Yes, of course, Bull replied. Then why am I working the second shift? In my opinion, it's the best place for you, 
he said, drawing attention. If you have a scheduling problem, discuss it with the captain through me. By this time, Alan had approached. Is there a problem, gentlemen? he asked. Lieutenant Jones doesn't like the bridge schedule, sir, Bull said. Alan frowned at the schedule. I understand his feelings, number one, he said. It's very unusual, don't you agree? Yes, sir. Normally, I would, Bull said. But I believe Lieutenant Jones's knowledge and experience are best utilized on the second shift. It also gives us a chance to train other gunnery officers on the first shift. My crap detectors went off. I couldn't believe the crap he was feeding the captain. Is that the only reason, Commander, or is there more? Alan asked, clearly skeptical. If I may speak freely, sir, Bull said quietly. Always number one, Alan replied. I've never liked spouses working on the same ship, especially in close quarters. I don't want them distracted from their duties. That's what I thought, Alan said. I understand, but I won't let this affect their morale. Make sure they spend time together, understood? Yes, sir, Bull said. Alan looked at me. Can you do that, Lieutenant? Yes, sir, I replied. Good, carry on, Alan said, walking away. Bull smirked at me. Don't worry, Jones. I'll keep an eye on your wife, he said before leaving. I turned to Alice, who put a finger to her lips. Don't say anything, Bill, she said. We'll talk later. I'll call Lieutenant Robinson. Yes, ma'am, I said quietly. I glanced at Tabby, who was focused on her console, her face flushed. I couldn't tell if it was from embarrassment or guilt. I left the bridge feeling more humiliated than ever. Something was definitely off. I headed to the galley, hoping to grab something to eat. It wasn't a usual meal time, so I knew the selection would be limited. Not much available right now, Lieutenant, said the man behind the plexiglass partition. We have hamburgers made of artificial meat. They taste terrible, but they'll fill you up. That'll do, I said. He handed me one on a tray and offered a packet of flavored ketchup. Want some axle grease to make it better? He asked with a smile. Sure, why not, I said, taking the packet. Thanks. Any time, Lieutenant, he replied. I grabbed a small bottle of chocolate milk and found a vacant table. I ate the burger, drenched it in ketchup, and downed the milk. The burger tasted awful, but it filled me up, and the ketchup helped a bit. I put the tray away, tossed the trash, and headed back to my quarters. I lay down, trying to sleep, but couldn't stop thinking about Bull. What did he mean about looking after Tabby? After an hour of tossing and turning, I gave up. Frustrated, I put on my workout clothes and headed to the small gym on one of the lower decks. When I arrived, I was relieved to find the gym empty. Good, I thought. I could vent my frustration without anyone around. I stretched, worked out on the treadmill and weight machine, then adjusted the gravity to 0.4 G. Feeling lighter, I practiced some grav tack techniques for half an hour. By then, I was sweaty and ready to sleep. I reset the gravity, returned to my quarters, showered in the tiny bathroom, set my alarm, and fell asleep instantly. When the alarm went off, I got up, showered, shaved, dressed, and headed to the galley for a snack. It was much better than the faux meat burger I had earlier. I arrived at the bridge just as Tabby was leaving. Hello, stranger, I said. She looked at me and smiled. Hi, she said. I didn't get a chance to tell you, but you did a great job with the launch, I said. Thank you, she replied. Maybe I'll come by during my lunch break and we can spend some time together, I suggested. I could see her thinking it over, expecting her to make an excuse. Thankfully, she didn't. Sure, I'll set the alarm, she said. Maybe you can eat me instead of one of those fake burgers. Works for me, I said. I'll see you in six hours. I'll be there, she said, giving me a quick kiss. I love you. I love you too, I replied. I watched her walk away, hopeful we could make it work. Then I turned and saw Bull grinning. About damn time you showed up, Jones he said. I checked my watch. My shift doesn't start for another 15 minutes, Commander, I said. I just wanted to talk to my wife before duty, if that's okay with you, sir. I thought he might lash out, but he calmed down. Yeah, all right, he said, and walked down the corridor. I went onto the bridge and took over for Lieutenant Robinson, who handed me my shift and walked out. As I started the calibration, Alice approached me. How are you holding up? She asked. I'll be fine, Alice, I said. Seriously, how are you doing? She pressed. It's not easy, but I can handle it. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Listen, I know you have a lot on your mind, but I think you need to keep an eye on your wife and Commander Travers, she said. I looked at her, shocked. Do you think there's something going on between them? Maybe. Call it female intuition, but I've seen little glances between them. Nothing obvious, but there's definitely a spark, she explained. Got it, Alice? Thanks for the heads up. 
I plan to meet with her on my lunch break. Hope that helps. I hope so too, Bill, she said. Should we tell the captain? I asked. She shook her head. Not unless you have solid evidence. Accusing a senior officer without proof can backfire and hurt your career. Just stay alert and keep your wife alert. I'll watch during the first shift. Okay, Alice, thanks. She nodded and left the bridge. I checked the calibration and inspected the cruise missiles and weapon stations. When I returned, Alan was waiting. Interested in target practice? He asked. Sure thing, I agreed. All right, launch some drones, he instructed. I set up five drones and activated the mini lasers, akin to old miniguns but with intense heat. The lasers swiftly destroyed the drones. Well done, Lieutenant, Alan praised. Thanks, sir, I replied. He suggested I take the center chair as the senior officer on watch while he rested. Yes, sir, thank you, I acknowledged, knowing his knack for power naps from past experience. He left the bridge, and I took over his spot. Sitting in the commander's chair, I felt in control, overseeing the ship's activities. Each crew member wore a wrist device, serving multiple functions like timekeeping, communication, tracking, and vital sign monitoring, except during showers. Using the tracking monitor, I located Travers in his quarters, confirmed by his steady pulse indicating he wore the device. Checking for Jones, I found two Williams, myself, and Tabitha. Choosing Tabitha, I observed her beacon in our quarters, mirroring Travers' status, asleep with normal vitals. Though tempted to review their tracker history, lacking necessary credentials prevented me. Convinced of their engagement, I deactivated the tracking monitor and focused on other tasks. Looking around the busy bridge, it seemed my presence went unnoticed as everyone attended to their duties. Returning to my console, I double-checked the checklist, finding everything operating as expected. A scheduled course adjustment loomed about an hour ahead, already programmed into the navigation system. The communications officer remained in touch with Houston's flight control, sparing my involvement unless immediate captain intervention was needed. The engineer on duty monitored engine and vital system conditions. The helmsman and navigator ensured smooth ship flight, especially for the impending course correction. After logging the hour's activities, I briefly inspected the weapons console before returning to the central chair. About two hours into the shift, Petty Officer Marks took drink orders from everyone, allowing beverages with covers and straws at our stations. After a brief absence, she returned with drinks for all. Shortly before my lunch break, Alan resumed his seat, where I briefed him on the shift's progress. He acknowledged, making notes in his journal. Thank you, Lieutenant, he said, gesturing for me to take my break with a subtle wink. Yes, sir, I replied, stepping away from my post. Heading to our shared quarters, I paused at the open hatch, taking a deep breath before entering. Tabby had just woken up to the alarm. Ready for dinner? She asked with defiance. Smiling, I joined her on the bed. Absolutely, I said, initiating affectionate gestures. Subsequently, we shared an carnal moment. That was amazing, she expressed. Much needed. Agreed. Missed you, I confessed. Missed you too. Love you so much, she reciprocated. Love you too, I replied. Time to clean up and head back, she reminded. Checking the time, I realized there were about 40 minutes left in the break. You're right, I acknowledged. Round two during your lunch break, she suggested with a smile. Definitely, I agreed. Feeling somewhat improved, I rose, showered swiftly, and headed to the galley. Before exiting the cabin, I kissed her, then adjusted the lighting and reduced the gravity to 0.7 Gs, knowing my grasp of grav talk was crucial for our performance an area where Bull lacked expertise. Lovemaking in space is far from the movie's portrayals. In microgravity, blood moves to the head, not the genitals. Fortunately, the ship's default gravity of 0.8 g allowed us some enjoyment, though it remained challenging. Lower gravity could have made it impossible. Testosterone levels decrease in microgravity, potentially leading to heart shrinkage and reduced blood volume. These concerns, along with pregnancy risks, once deterred NASA from sending couples to space. However, tales of romantic escapades persist, like the rumored exploits of a cosmonaut on the Russian Mir station in the 1990s. Despite initial denials, the cosmonaut later admitted to natural desires, but downplayed their significance. He even mentioned a superior's suggestion to bring an inflatable doll to prevent attachment. Although old restrictions lingered, advancements like artificial gravity in the early 2000s made many concerns obsolete. Consequently, the core relaxed its stance, allowing married couples to engage in space closeness under specific conditions. 
After a satisfying tuna sandwich, I returned to the bridge with two minutes to spare before the break. Alan greeted me, asking about my lunch. Satisfied, I settled at my console as instructed. Over the next 17 days, Tabby often visited during lunch breaks, offering comfort during the journey. Minimal interaction with Bull eased concerns, and updates from Alice revealed no suspicious activity. Upon arrival at Mars Station, doubts crept in about my initial reaction. After docking with Mars Station, I changed into my Class C uniform, hoping for shore leave with Tabby at Huygens Base. However, my plans were disrupted when Bull informed me of a problem with one or more weapon stations. What? I exclaimed, surprised. Just hours ago, during my shift, I had checked them and found no issues. I turned to Lieutenant Robinson, asking if he knew of any problems. He indicated it happened right before docking. Feeling suspicious, I was determined to investigate further. We've got 72 hours here, Bull reminded me. Make sure those weapons are ready by launch. Disheartened, I glanced at Tabby. It'll be okay, she reassured me. We'll still visit Huygens. I'll bring you back a souvenir, all right? Bull smirked. Don't worry, Jones. I'll watch over your wife, he assured me. Yeah, I bet you will, you idiot, I thought. Alan approached us. Ready for some beach time? He asked. Yes, Bull replied. But Jones needs to check the weapon systems. Any issues? Alan inquired. The mini laser's calibration was disrupted, sir, Robinson explained. When did this happen? Alan asked. I noticed it before securing the station, Robinson replied. Alan turned to me. Better take a look, Lieutenant, he directed. I'll join you, he added. Thank you, sir, I said, glancing at Bull. I appreciate it. I'll assist, Lieutenant, Robinson offered. Much obliged, Robinson, I replied. Let's head to the station before the shuttles depart, Bull urged. Tabby looked at me silently. Do it, number one, Alan instructed. They left, and I noticed Tabby's silence. I turned to Alice. Something's fishy, Bill, she whispered. I'll keep watch. Thanks, I replied. She smiled and walked away. I'll change into my work clothes, I said. Which lasers are acting up? Number two and number five, sir, Robinson reported. I'll handle two. You check five, but we'll inspect them all, I instructed. Understood, sir, Robinson said, heading out. I saw Alan contemplating. I'll meet you at laser station two, I informed him. I'll be there shortly, he replied. Grabbing my tools, I exited the bridge. After a few minutes, Alan joined me, now back in his work uniform. What's happening? he inquired. Just about to remove the control box cover, I replied, beginning to unscrew it. Upon inspection, I discovered the issue. A gear in the drive system had broken off, with the E-clip missing. Uh-oh, I muttered. What's wrong? Alan asked. Someone tampered with this device, I explained. The E-clip is gone and the drive gear is damaged. Could it have affected the weapons? He questioned. Absolutely, I confirmed. The impact could have wrecked the system. If the lasers were active, they might have pierced the hull. How could this happen? He wondered. It seems deliberate, I speculated. These devices are sealed, accessible only with a specific tool, like this one, I said, displaying it. Can it be fixed? He inquired. Yes, but it'll take time, I replied. About eight to ten hours, assuming no further issues arise. Wow, he remarked. Need assistance? While I appreciated his offer, the task was solo. No, sir, I can handle it, but thanks for offering, I said. There's only space for one set of hands. Just then, Robinson contacted me. Boss, the Eclipse broken and the drive gears damaged, he reported. I turned to Alan. We need to replace the entire control box, I informed him. Agreed, he nodded. Proceed and get the armory to inspect all weapon platforms. Understood, Robinson acknowledged. What are the odds of two control units failing simultaneously? Queried Alan. Highly unlikely, I responded. These units are typically very reliable. I've never seen one malfunction, let alone two simultaneously. They're considered the most stable in our inventory. Could it be a manufacturing flaw? He suggested. Doubtful, sir, I replied. These units undergo rigorous testing before installation. In my experience with hundreds of them, I've never encountered such a situation. I'll need to notify Houston, Alan decided. Let's bring in engineers from the Martian station and postpone a full level 5 diagnostic. It's absurd that a trillion-dollar spacecraft could be halted by a cheap E-clip, I nodded. Keep me informed, I instructed. Yes, sir, I affirmed. As he exited the cramped space, I resumed my examination. Upon removing the control box entirely, I noticed a dark stain on the interior hull. It wasn't typical transmission grease, 
Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be blood. The saboteur had evidently injured themselves in the process. Retrieving tweezers from the toolbox, I carefully collected a sample of the substance. I placed it in a small sealed bag and returned it to the toolkit, planning to have it tested for DNA at a medical facility later. Meanwhile, an armorer replaced the faulty control box. Despite trying to focus on my task, I couldn't shake off the disturbing thoughts. Bull seemed to go out of his way to separate Tabby and me, altering schedules and now this sabotage. His words about taking care of Tabby only fueled my suspicions. The idea of her being unfaithful with him made me furious and sick to my stomach. Knowing Bull had been her counselor at the academy and that they had served together before intensified my concerns. Had something been going on between them all along? After completing the installation and running a dry test, I logged the maintenance entry, lamenting the ten hours lost that were meant for shore leave with Tabby. Reviewing the log, I found no clues. Robinson confirmed the new unit installation and reported no other issues. Despite knowing it would disrupt his shore leave, I instructed him to conduct a full visual inspection and inventory of all weapons and missiles. He agreed and got to work. En route to the bridge, I visited sickbay and spoke with the on-duty corpsman. How are you, Lieutenant Jones? She greeted me. Would you be willing to undergo a DNA test? I inquired. We have the necessary equipment, but final analysis requires verification by a certified lab, she explained. I presented my sample. I need to identify whose blood this is, I stated. Can you do that? Certainly, she replied. It will take a few hours and we'll need to compare it to existing DNA records. May I ask why? I can't discuss it at the moment, Chief, I replied. I just need to know whose it is, and I need you to keep it confidential. She agreed to look into it, and promised to notify me of any findings. Thanks, Chief, I appreciate it, I expressed gratitude. You're welcome, sir, she responded with a smile. She was quite attractive, and for a moment, I pondered how she would look out of uniform. But the thought passed quickly. Afterward, I proceeded to the bridge to give my report. Alan was at the hatch to his ready room when I arrived. Fixed it, he inquired. Yes, sir. I confirmed. Lieutenant Robinson is currently checking the remaining systems. All right, step into my office, please, he directed. Inside, I found Alice and Commander Carson, the ship's senior security officer. Alan closed the hatch and took his seat. Thank you for your prompt response, he acknowledged, addressing Alice and Commander Carson. We have a situation. It seems we have a saboteur aboard, Alan informed. Two weapon systems were sabotaged before our arrival at Mars Station. I've been tasked by command to conduct an initial investigation and to contact the Core Criminal Investigations Division on Huygens. They won't arrive for at least 36 hours, so you have that time to gather as much information as possible. I'm granting both of you access to the entire tracker history temporarily. I need to know who accessed those weaponized units as soon as possible. This investigation must be thorough yet discreet. Understand? We can't have the crew finding out, he emphasized. We understand, sir, confirmed Commander Carson. In the meantime, a team of Mars engineers is conducting full level 5 diagnostics on the ship. It'll take about 72 hours. Command doesn't want us departing with a potential saboteur on board, and I concur. The mission might be cancelled, Alan explained. Any questions? Just one, sir, I interjected, drawing everyone's attention. Yes, Lieutenant, Alan prompted. I discovered blood on the replaced control box housing. I sent a sample to sickbay for DNA analysis, I reported. Good call. Alan commended. I'll speak with Chief Benson about it. Anything else? We shook our heads. Dismissed. You have your tasks, Alan concluded. Yes, sir, Commander Carson affirmed. Exiting the ready room, I secured my tool bag on the weapons console. As I prepared to depart the bridge, Alice called out to me. Yes, ma'am, I responded. Bill, I've been monitoring Tabby and Commander Travers. It seems they're quite familiar with each other, she disclosed, showing me her phone with pictures. Shocked, I saw Tabby and Bull entering a club hand in hand, dancing, drinking, and engaging in carnal behavior. Then Alice revealed images of them entering a hotel, implying their intentions were clear. I'm sorry, Bill, she murmured softly. I felt you needed to know. Thank you, Alice, I replied, struggling to hold back tears. Will you inform the captain? she inquired. I have no choice but to report it, she affirmed. But I wanted you to hear it first. I appreciate that, I acknowledged. Leaving the bridge, I caught up with Robinson. We completed the remaining system checks and conducted an inventory. My shift ended and I grabbed a snack in the galley before returning to my quarters, attempting to sleep. It was difficult with thoughts of Tubby and Bull swirling in my mind.
but I managed to stay awake for a while. Eventually I rose, showered, dressed, and as I prepared to leave, Tabby entered the cabin, appearing refreshed with a glow that often followed closeness. A part of me seethed with anger. Did you enjoy yourselves? I asked calmly. Yes, we did, she replied. Just returned. Sorry you couldn't join. Maybe next time. I remained silent, observing her. What were all the engineers doing on the station? She inquired. Routine maintenance, I replied. What's your plan now? She asked. I'm going to rest for a bit. Exhausted and off duty for the next 12 hours, are you starting your shift? I questioned. Yes, I affirmed. Did you resolve the issue? She inquired. I believe so, I responded. Good, she said. Missed you out there. Really? That's not the impression I got, I retorted. What do you mean? She asked. I heard you and Bull had fun, I stated. Anything you want to share? We danced, had a few drinks, but that's it, she insisted. Nothing else? I probed. Of course not, she exclaimed, pretending surprise. Why would you think that? Nothing, I said. I have to get to work. As I moved towards the door, Tabby halted me. She attempted to kiss me, but I turned my head, receiving a kiss on the cheek. Bill, I love you, she expressed. What's wrong? You tell me, I replied, leaving the cabin without awaiting her response. I questioned myself about the woman's identity. Did she truly believe she could approach me after being with someone else and expect no reaction? Did she think I wouldn't see through her deception? Upon reaching my station, I noticed Bull's absence. Continuing with my tasks, I carried on with diagnostics. After about seven hours, realizing I hadn't eaten, I took a lunch break. Deciding to visit Tabby in our quarters, I intended to discuss matters with her. However, upon opening the hatch, I was confronted with a sight no husband should witness. Tabby and Bull were on our bed. I noticed an increase in gravity, set at 0.9 g. They both turned to me as Tabby hastily disengaged. Bull, with a smirk, ordered me to shut the hatch, questioning my presence. As Bull dressed, he mocked me, asking if I lacked lovemaking education. After donning his flight suit, he suggested we talk and motioned for a walk. Addressing Tabby, he promised to return for further conversation. Tabby looked at me with sorrow. I'm sorry, Bill, she whispered. We'll discuss it later, I responded. Bull declined my question and motioned for me to follow him. Sensing trouble, I activated the video recording function on my suit. All our suits were equipped with a camera feature for such situations. I wanted this encounter documented due to my unease. Bull praised my idea of adjusting the gravity in my quarters as we walked. However, he revealed he had discovered my alterations soon after my arrival. When I inquired how long he had known, he corrected my phrasing with a smirk. Remaining silent, I urged him to continue. He shared that it began during his second year at the academy when he served as Tabby's counselor, claiming she had sought his help with a problem. He insinuated that she was susceptible to his charms. He laughed at his own remarks, thinking himself clever. I seethed with anger but refrained from violence, mindful of my career. So you're always there for her, huh? I queried. Absolutely, Lieutenant, he responded. You've got a knack for investigation. Was that why you changed the bridge schedule? I pressed. You caught on, Jones, he admitted. And the weapon system sabotage? I continued. Between us, yes, he confirmed, air quoting, investigation. What's your next move? I inquired. Planning to injury me? He chuckled, guiding us into the elevator. Certainly not, Lieutenant, he assured. Would I take out an officer just for a fling? For now, yes, I retorted. He led me out of the elevator, insisting I was mistaken. According to his recent investigation, I discovered my wife's infidelity, grew distraught, sabotaged the weapon systems to frame her lover, and then took my own life when she revealed her intention to leave me. We halted at the starboard airlock, opposite our docked station. The inner hatch was open, all spacesuits removed, and he brandished a pistol. You figured it all out? I challenged. Absolutely, he smirked. Now into the airlock. You won't succeed, I countered. He scoffed. Who'll command believe? You, a failing husband, or me, a seasoned veteran? He retorted. Assessing the situation, I noted the gravity set at 0.8 g. Not ideal, but manageable. Seizing the moment, I leaped up, struck him twice, and locked him in the airlock. Angered, he demanded I release him. I have one question, Commander, I interjected. What? Did Tabitha know your plan? Of course, he affirmed. It was her idea. Now open the door. I won't say more, he warned, aiming his weapon at me. Now do it. Gazing at the controls, I responded, yes, sir, and activated the button. 
His eyes widened as he realized. The outer door slid open, and he was thrust into the vacuum of space. Caught off guard, he struggled, knowing he had only seconds without a spacesuit. In the void, the air in his lungs would expand, causing immense pain. He would either freeze or suffocate within 15 seconds. I activated the comms, announcing, Man overboard, number two starboard airlock. Instantly, the alarm blared, drawing a crowd to the airlock. Alan and Alice rushed over, followed by Tabby. Commander Travers, sir, I said, handing him a drive with a video recording. He confessed to sabotaging the weapon and having an affair with Lieutenant Jones. He also planned to eliminate me and make it look like self-destruction. It's all here. Bull, Tabby exclaimed, peering into the airlock. By now, Bull's ejection had sent him into an unstable orbit around Mars, making recovery difficult. Turning to me, tears streaming down her face, she accused, You eliminated him. You fool, I hate you. That's enough, Lieutenant, Alan intervened, taking Tabby to the orderlies. Take her to sick bay, then hand her over to security. He turned to me solemnly. You're relieved of duty for the investigation. I'll handle it. Yes, sir, I responded quietly. All right, that's it, Alan commanded. Back to work. We've done all we can here. He turned to Commander Carson. Once she's settled, find her a berth away from the bridge. Reach out to Mars Station for Commander Travers's recovery. Understood, sir, Carson replied, walking off. Alan then addressed Alice. Looks like you're stepping up, Alice. You're my new number one until further notice. Adjust bridge duties accordingly. The mission's likely scrapped. Yes, sir, she acknowledged. We've wrapped our initial inquiry, sir. We need to go over our findings. In my quarters, ASAP, he instructed. Got it, sir, she affirmed, then turned to me. I'm sorry, Bill, she offered. You didn't deserve any of this. Thanks, Commander, I replied, heading to my quarters. Sorting Tabby's belongings, I packed them in her duffel bag. I wanted her far from me likely reassigned to the vacant chief pilot's cabin. Security later retrieved her things. I didn't inquire, nor did I care. I flipped the mattress and changed the soiled bedding, tossing the old linens into the laundry. With restricted access to my quarters, I settled at the computer console and filled out a divorce request, based on infidelity. Since our marriage fell under JAG jurisdiction, the divorce process also involved them. There was no property or children to divide, and our incomes were equal, so support wasn't applicable. It was a straightforward split where she kept hers and I kept mine. After submitting the request, I awaited confirmation. Within 24 hours, two CIA agents from Huygens contacted me, hinting at a vengeful motive. During the interrogation, the JAG officer prevented me from making self-incriminating statements. I spent the next day on edge, avoiding crew interactions to sidestep gossip. While seated in my quarters, Alan and Alice arrived unexpectedly, alleviating my tension. Lieutenant, Alan began, taking a seat. Alice joined, and I relaxed on the bed. Mars Station recovered Commander Travers' body and confiscated the illegal firearm attached to him, Alan stated. The CIU report confirms your actions as self-defense. Commander Travers was present at both sabotaged weapon stations, as shown in the tracking history logs, he continued. Right before Lieutenant Robinson detected the calibration error, Alice added. The DNA from the blood matches the commander's, along with his confession to you, proving his responsibility for the sabotage, Alan clarified. Your wife claims ignorance, but she's detained as an accessory to Travers's plot against you. Possible conspiracy charges await her on Earth. So we're heading back to Earth, sir? I inquired. Alan affirmed. Indeed, Bill. The mission's on hold for now. We'll face a board of inquiry upon return. Can I resume duty? I asked. After some persuasion, Houston agreed. With two officers down, we need you on bridge duty. Can you handle ops and gunnery? Alan questioned, turning to Alice for confirmation. Yes, sir, I affirmed. Good, he replied. We launch in 12 hours, so make sure you're rested and ready. Thank you, sir, I said. May I speak with my wife? I need some answers. Are you certain about this, Bill? He inquired. Absolutely, sir, I confirmed. After a brief pause... He consented. All right, Bill, he agreed. But Commander Brewster will accompany you. Do you agree, Alice? Yes, sir, she confirmed. Very well, he concluded. Now, get to work, then rest up. It's time you earned your paycheck. Yes, sir, I responded. As he left, Alice turned to me. Ready, Lieutenant, she asked. I nodded. Yes, ma'am, I replied. We exited and headed to the brig on the lower deck. Just so you know, Captain Simmons has commended you, she informed me. For what? I questioned, surprised. He believes your actions saved lives, preventing potential damage to the ship had Travers fired the weapon in the airlock, she explained. Damn, 
I muttered. She grinned. Congrats, she said. We arrived at the brig and checked in with the on-duty security officer before approaching a small cell where Tabby sat on the bed, clad in an orange jumpsuit. What's up, Lieutenant? She sneered. So now it's just Lieutenant, not even Bill or Lieutenant Jones, I remarked. Fine, prisoner. I'll ask a few questions and then leave you be. Go ahead, Lieutenant, she replied, staring ahead without glancing at me. How long were you involved with Travers? Since sophomore year at the academy, she admitted. He was my counselor. I know, I acknowledged. Where did it start? Do you really want to know? She challenged. Yeah, I do, I affirmed. All right, since you asked. I failed a test. He helped me cheat. I owed him, so I entertained him. I enjoyed it, so it kept happening, she explained. So you cheated with him and then betrayed me, is that it? Yes, she confessed. You don't know how many times I thought of him when I was with you. And you know what? I liked it. You know what else? What? I asked, feeling sickened. He's been places you couldn't reach. Surprised you could even feel me after him, she taunted. And you enjoyed working with him all those times. When we could, she admitted. You know it's hard to do in low gravity. That's why we did it before and after missions. Did you ever love me, or was it all a lie? I loved you, she admitted. But I enjoyed being with him, too. It was just lovemaking, nothing more. You knew his plans once we boarded, didn't you? Yeah, I did. He wanted to stagger shifts so we wouldn't see each other much. But you found a way to talk to me, surprising both of us. So we decided to wait until Mars, she explained. And you were aware of the weapon sabotage. I knew he was up to something, but not the specifics, she confessed. Just that he wanted to stop your shore leave. We didn't think you'd escalate it to this extent, and my supposed self-destruction was a bonus, right? He blamed it on you. Was it? It was his idea, she stated. But you went along. You never intervened, did you? No, I didn't, she admitted quietly. And I'm sorry, I never thought he'd actually do it. He failed, and you'll end up in jail. Was it worth it? Doesn't matter, she shrugged. I was proud of you, how you handled the ship. I loved you. But now... I regret ever meeting you. I'll testify at your trial. Goodbye. As I turned, she called my name, apologizing. Without looking back, I raised my middle finger and walked away. Upon returning to Earth, Tabby was incarcerated in a federal prison for the duration of the investigation and court-martial. Crew members, including myself, Alan, and Alice, testified extensively, enduring days of waiting for developments. My divorce was approved in early April, with the JAG officer handling the remaining paperwork. On Friday, April 18th, we assembled in the hearing room. Alan, Alice, and I sat together while Tabby entered in chains flanked by armed prison guards. Council members, distinguished by their decorated uniforms, joined the proceedings. Admiral Cartwright, leading the council, initiated the meeting. Please sit, he began, clarifying it as a board of inquiry rather than a trial, aimed at uncovering what occurred and preventing future incidents. After summarizing the events of the Mars trip, he condemned Commander Travers for prioritizing personal agendas over duty, resulting in endangerment and ship damage. Directing his attention to me, he acknowledged my role. Senior Lieutenant William Jones, he said, causing me to pause. After a moment, he continued, commending my actions for potentially saving lives and preventing sabotage. Recognizing my diligence, he approved the Distinguished Service Medal recommendation and assigned me to the Advanced Operations School for Training starting June 1st. Thank you, sir, I said. The Admiral acknowledged and shifted focus to Alan. Captain Alan Simmons, he addressed. Alan stood attentively. The Council acknowledges your efforts amidst unprecedented circumstances. We recognize your reluctance to challenge senior authority and the unique challenges you've faced. However, as the ship's captain, you bear ultimate responsibility for its operations. I understand, Admiral, Alan replied. The Council affirms your command of the USS Armstrong, but notes an entry on your record. Given the ship's modernization, a new crew assignment will be arranged. We propose promoting Lieutenant Som Dr. Brewster to commander for the first officer role. Expect updated mission orders soon, he concluded. Thank you, Admiral, Alan acknowledged. Then the Admiral turned to Tabby. Senior Lieutenant Tabitha Abernathy, he addressed, using her maiden name post-divorce. Tabby rose with the others. This board expresses profound disappointment in your conduct. You have not only disgraced your ex-husband, but also tarnished your uniform and the service as a whole. 
Your involvement in this affair, unintended pun aside, may have endangered the lives of many, including your ex-husband. Your statements, along with Travers, led us to reassess your entire record, including your academy performance. Travers' intervention helped you pass a critical test without which you might not have obtained your commission. While your piloting record was commendable, it's evident you should not have been commissioned. Your liaison with Travers resulted in tragedy and endangered lives. Your actions are incompatible with your role. We recognize your pending court-martial, but this board has advised the personnel office to revoke your commission, demote you to an E-1 crewman, and reduce your pay, effective immediately, he informed, signaling the guards to escort her out. As she approached us, she paused, tears streaming down her face. Bill, she started, her voice trembling. Address me cautiously, crewman, I retorted sharply. She straightened up, tears still flowing. Request to address you as lieutenant, denied, I snapped. Remove her from my sight, I instructed the guards, who promptly complied as she sobbed. At that moment, her words held no significance to me. A detailed report of the council's decisions will be sent to each of you and added to your records. This council session is adjourned, announced Admiral Cartwright, closing the meeting with a gavel strike. We rose as the council departed. After their departure, Alan turned to me. Well, that wasn't too bad, he remarked. How about a drink? I could use one. I think it went rather well, sir, Alice chimed in. Why not? I agreed. We exited the premises and headed to the O Club, where we continued to savor our victory. Update. <laughs> Standing at the airlock to Galileo Station, orbiting Mars's dark side, I reflected on the past 17 months. Tubby's court-martial had ended a month before I entered the School of Advanced Spacecraft Management. I testified for the prosecution, though recalling my time with her and Bull on Armstrong was unpleasant. This time, Tabby appeared different, wearing a crewman's uniform without flight wings. She had visibly lost weight, her eyes sunken and sorrowful. Losing everything she cherished, her rank, wings, and former husband, she faced a bleak career outlook. Her record would forever bear a stain, barring her from piloting any spacecraft. As the court convened, we rose until instructed otherwise. The judge inquired about the verdict, and the senior member, a full commander, announced guilt for Tabby as an accessory to my attempted homicide, but acquitted her of conspiracy. The defense argued a lack of direct evidence implicating her in the conspiracy. Yet it was clear she knew of Travers' plan to eject me into space and took no action to stop it. The judge sentenced her to ten years of hard labor in federal prison, followed by a dishonorable discharge. With a gavel strike, the case concluded, Tabby left in chains, never acknowledging me. I attended my class in Florida near Cape Canaveral and relished the training, along with the pleasant weather and surroundings, which included plenty of exposed skin. Graduating after 18 months, I was promoted to lieutenant commander and received orders to Galileo, a secluded station orbiting Mars unlike the visible Mars station. I was intrigued by what lay ahead. Upon arrival, I was greeted by Captain Hawkins, an attractive officer, who briefed me on the situation and assured me of a smooth transition. Are you prepared to see your new home for the next few years? She asked, leading me to the observation deck. Pressing a button, she revealed a massive advanced ship, the USS Enterprise. This will be your domain as my operations officer. Ready for adventure? She asked, her eyes gleaming. Absolutely, Captain, I replied. With a laugh, she informed me of our imminent launch in 15 days and assigned me daily briefings. Welcome aboard, Commander, she said, shaking my hand before departing. As I admired the ship, I couldn't help but smile at the sight of the USS Enterprise emblazoned on its side. 